Throughout the years, Nintendo's tried basically everything. Like, they've done it all. Fighting games, sports games, shooters, and each time they try a new style of game like this, they always find some way to break the mold. Like, fuck you, Mario's a clock now. Nice. But if there's one thing I wish they'd do more of, it's without a doubt rhythm games. Now, pretty much everyone has the same mental image of what a rhythm game is. It looks a little something like this. You know, your Guitar Heroes or DDRs of the world. For the most part, they all follow the same format, with some gimmick thrown in to keep things fresh. The gimmick in this one is Carpal Tunnel. But whether it's a rhythm game they made themselves, or one they just published, Nintendo rhythm games very rarely follow this tried and true formula, and instead opt to give us a completely new take on the genre. So let's take a look at a few of them and see what makes Nintendo rhythm games so special. All right, so let's just get the big one out of the way first. Together now. Uh, I absolutely adore these games. Os Tatake Oendon was like this bat insane rhythm game for the DS. It was developed by a small Japanese studio called Innis and published by Nintendo in 2005. In this game, you play as the Oendon, a group based on Japanese cheering squads who cheer on various people in need. Uh, family won't shut the hell up, giant rat attacking your city, just can't stop wet in the bed. Yes. Well, just calling the Oendon for help. The gameplay has you tapping these numbered circles on the bottom screen in time with the music, while uh, now, now here's the kicker. The top screen shows a comic book style cinematic of the person you're currently helping. Play well enough and you'll see them succeed, but if you completely blow it... Neat. These scenes are just so quirky and charming. Uh, they're also presented in a way that even with the language barrier, I never felt lost or confused. I could always tell what was going on through the visuals alone which is honestly pretty impressive considering how weird this game can get. The soundtrack is also phenomenal, with a bunch of surprisingly good covers of J-pop songs, like you got some Asian Kung Fu generation, the opening of Full Metal Alchemist, and- Oh, sorry, my weeaboo was showing. Now, despite it only ever releasing in Japan, the game actually gained somewhat of a cult following around the world, with tons of people importing the game. Nintendo of America actually took note of this and figured they could capitalize on this whole thing. So they worked with Innis to create a completely new game made specifically for Western audiences called Elite Beat Agents. The Elite Beat Agents are at your service. This game replaced the Owen Don with these cool agent guys, and the J-pop centric soundtrack was swapped for one with such hits as The Anthem, YMCA, and F***ing Skater Boy. To be fair though, they're all pretty decent covers, and while the soundtrack is aged like I have, it's still just as enjoyable to play as Owen Don, with the addicting gameplay and quirkiness still intact. Elite Beat Agents sold relatively well, and critics seemed into it, but uh, apparently that wasn't good enough for Nintendo, with them saying they were disappointed with how the game performed. So, yeah, that sucks. But thankfully, the first Owen Don did well enough to get a sequel in 2007. But anyways, though, I, I guess I can address the goddamn elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I'll see you. In September of 2007, the same year Owen Don 2 released, a fan game simply called Os was released on PC. The gameplay shares a lot of similarities with the Owen Don series, which by that I mean, it's exactly the same. 
The main difference being Os on PC exploded in popularity while Owendon and Elite Beat Agents have remained uh, relatively niche. It's gotten to the point where I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of Os players didn't even know these games were a thing. Arguably the biggest contributing factor to Os's success, however, is definitely its custom song library, with users uploading hundreds of thousands of custom beat maps for songs that were probably totally maybe downloaded through completely legal means. There's also a ton of community events and tournaments which definitely help skyrocket its popularity. Uh, the fact that it's free probably didn't hurt things either. But even with all of these additions, I just can't get into it like I did with Owen Don and Elite Beat Agents. And I think it's because they kinda turned it into just another rhythm game. Game? You see, what made these games so special, for me at least, was all the charm and character packed into them. The cinematics, the Owen Down themselves, the presentation, the quirkiness of it all. All of it really made the series into a truly one of a kind experience that hasn't and probably will never be replicated again. Hello, Grind City. This is the Midnight Hour with me, Barbara the Bat. Putting something in Smash is a pretty good way to revive, like, anything. Like, just take a look at Fire Emblem, Kid Icarus, Earthbound, hell, I'd, I'd even argue F-Zero all found new audiences thanks to being included in Smash. It, it seriously works every time. Well, unless your name's Barbara the fucking Bad, I guess. Be honest, how many of you, when you first saw this assist trophy in Brawl, went, Oh shit, they got fucking Barbara in here? Yeah, don't lie, I, I mean, I had no idea who the hell she was. Was this an Evanescence rap? Well, she's apparently from a series of rhythm games made by Nintendo called Daigasso Band Brothers, or as it's known in Europe, Jam with the Band, or as it's known in the US. Yeah, it, it, didn't, it didn't come out in the US. So, what is Daigasso Band Brothers? Well, it's a series that actually started development on the Game Boy Color before eventually being moved to the Game Boy Advance. Back then, the game was simply called Game Boy Music. The idea was to create a multiplayer focused rhythm game that featured a bunch of different MIDI instruments for you to play around with. But then Nintendo remembered how shit the GBA sound hardware was and went, oh shit, oh, sh we can't work with this. Which made development quite a bit more challenging. Like, they actually toyed with the idea of packaging the game with a goddamn speaker just to get around this. But in the end, the game was unfortunately shelved. However, the team working on it was apparently so passionate about the project that they basically begged the higher-ups at Nintendo to revive it on the DS. The higher-ups agreed, which led to the game finally being released as Daigasso Band Brothers in 2004 as a Japanese launch title for the DS. Welcome to GB Music. Knock the door, please. Hi. Now, at first glance, this seems like a pretty basic rhythm game. You're just pressing buttons in time with the music. Uh, nothing that hasn't been done like a million times already. But if you dig a little deeper, you'll soon discover just how ambitious this series is. So like I said, the game uses MIDI instruments, which MIDI instruments are like more or less digital instruments. I don't know, man. What do I look like? Wikipedia? Basically, this means you're able to choose any instrument in a song to play, but it also allows you to play with up to eight friends in a jam session where you're each playing a different instrument in an almost band-like setting. Keep in mind, this came out in 2004, a full three years before anything like Rock Band was trying this kind of thing, and this was without all the stupid plastic instruments. In the sequel, you could even connect your DS to your Wii to play the music out of your TV speakers to get better audio quality while playing with friends. It's all super ambitious stuff. 
Now, the set list is honestly pretty great, with a good variety of J-pop, classical, anime openings, and even some Nintendo tracks. There's 35 tracks in total, but it also came with a full-blown MIDI editor where you could create your own songs to play, which is pretty cool on its own, but then they took it a step further with the sequel and allowed you to upload your custom songs online for anyone to download and play. But there was a catch. Basically, you could only submit recreations of licensed songs, and you had to make sure they were absolutely 100% faithful to the original source material before submitting them. You see, Nintendo actually worked with the Japanese Society for Rights of Authors, Composers, and Publishers to officially license every song that was submitted. Because of this, they actually had to manually check every submission for accuracy and only accepted the best ones to be available for download. This process was apparently so strict that even one of the game's own developers had problems with getting his song accepted. In addition to all of that, you were only ever allowed to download 100 songs per cartridge, uh, 50 if you're playing the European version. You couldn't even delete songs to make room for more. Uh, once you downloaded a song, you had it forever, and once you hit that 100 song limit, that was it. No more songs for you. This was to save Nintendo from having to shell out a goddamn fortune in royalty fees since, you know, because each cartridge could only download 100 songs, Nintendo would only have to pay royalties for those 100 songs. It's honestly a pretty smart way to go about things for Nintendo, but you can probably imagine how frustrating something like this could be for people actually playing the game. Even with all of these strict rules and limitations though, you gotta admit this was a super ambitious service to offer in a rhythm game in the early 2000s. I mean a rhythm game with an always expanding library of user created songs that are also officially licensed? I honestly can't think of anything else that has a system like that. In 2013 they'd improve things even further with the third entry in the series, Daigasso Band Brothers P for the 3DS. This entry was developed by Intelligent Systems and actually added Vocaloid support. So now you could add lyrics to your song submissions, but you had to pay for each song you downloaded using tomatoes, which were the in-game currency, which you had to pay real money for, which was lame, but oh well. I'm sure it was a necessary evil to help pay for the royalty fees or something. Or they were just being greedy. Capitalism's a bitch after all. This whole music sharing system was just so ahead of its time though, and was definitely the biggest selling point of these games. But then it happened. <laughs> Nintendo's Wi-Fi connection service was shut down in 2014, and it took down all of Band Brothers Online services with it. Then, in April of 2020, the 3DS game had its online services shut down as well. And without these services, these games are honestly kind of bland? I mean, unless you're talented enough to make your own music, you're limited to only the base set list, which with the 3DS game is especially bad since it only included five songs on the cartridge. There's been some speculation that there might be a Switch version in development with the 3DS game no longer being supported, but nothing's been confirmed yet. Even if we were to get another entry though, this series is never leaving Japan again. It's just too much of a licensing nightmare. It's honestly a miracle they were able to get just one of the games out in Europe. Thankfully, if you want to get your Band Brothers fix, Barbara the Bad has been featured in quite a few other games that did release outside of Japan. Of course, there's Smash, but she was also in two other DS games. A game that teaches you English, and a game that teaches you magic tricks. Huh. Guess that whole uh, band thing didn't work out for you, huh, Barbara? She even got a costume in Mario Maker, which, speaking of Mario Maker, remember this girl? 
yeah, that ain't, that ain't Hatsune Miku or whatever. She's actually from the 3DS Band Brothers game. Hello, my name is Yu Ayasaki. Neat. But yeah, Dagaso Band Brothers. It might be a little too ambitious for its own good, but god damn, is it a cool idea? You gotta do what? I gotta believe. <laughs> While Parappa the Rappa is often cited as the first true rhythm game, I feel the genre didn't really pick up steam until Konami entered the ring with games like Beat Mania, Guitar Freaks, and of course, Dance Dance Revolution. Dance Dance Revolution! DDR was, and arguably still is, the most iconic modern arcade game of all time, and because of that, I'd argue it's also the most iconic rhythm game of all time. Yeah, that's right, I said it. Go fuck yourself, Guitar Rock Tour. DDR was everywhere throughout the 2000s. Uh, arcades, home consoles, handhelds, even your goddamn DVD player wasn't safe from it. Throughout all of these different releases though, there was always one that stood out from the rest, and that was, of course... Developed as a collaboration between Nintendo, Konami, and Hudson Soft was Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix, which released in 2005 as a GameCube exclusive. Each copy came bundled with a Mario-themed dance mat, which... Okay, okay, please don't make fun of me. I, I, I've literally never told anyone this, but... I only have a normie dance mat. <laughs> The game is more or less exactly what you'd expect, though. It's Mario and DDR. Uh, however, there's one big addition that sets this DDR apart from the rest. A full-blown story mode. Yeah, it sounds dumb, right? A story mode in a DDR game? <laughs> the only way you can make something like that work is if you did something crazy like, like, I, I don't know, make Waluigi the main villain. Son of a bitch. So yeah, Waluigi steals the magic music plot MacGuffin or whatever, and, and you have to get them back. It's not an amazing story or anything, but it has just enough of that Mario charm to keep you interested. Like, this isn't just a DDR game with a Mario skin. This feels like a Mario game, which surprised me. I honestly wasn't expecting something like this to work at all, but it works surprisingly well. There's also these level gimmicks and minigames which are a really nice touch and go a long way in making this feel like more than just another Dance Dance Revolution game. Honestly, overall, it's just a really solid rhythm game with a charming Mario aesthetic and a surprisingly enjoyable story mode. Also, the soundtrack's pretty good, I, I guess. Are you ready? Okay, the soundtrack's really good. Alright, for real this time. Together now. Rhythm Heaven, or Rhythm Paradise, or Rhythm World, or whatever the hell you want to call it, this thing has like 40 different names, is like the most Nintendo-ass rhythm game you can make. Basically, they took the rhythm genre, tore out all the pointless stuff, and BAM! They had a simple yet deep series of rhythm games that pretty much anyone could pick up and enjoy. No score counter, no hit markers, none of that. It's just you testing your natural sense of rhythm. Which I guess I don't have. Oh, come the fuck on! The series started development as a simple drum machine for the GBA. That is, until Sunku, who is a huge name in the Japanese music industry, approached Nintendo about making a music game. He wanted to make a game that didn't rely on visual cues like other rhythm games did. At first, Nintendo was uh, unsure if the concept would even work, but after a few meetings and some dance classes, they were eventually convinced. Then, two years later, in 2000, 2006, Rhythm Tengoku, or Rhythm Heaven, was released on the Game Boy Advance exclusively in Japan. 
this first game is just pure rhythm heaven. Two buttons and sometimes a d-pad is all you'll need for every single one of these mini games. Now the, the cool thing about rhythm heaven is that every mini game is designed in a way where you don't even need to look at the screen to play. It's all about just going along with the rhythm. So you could literally just cover up your screen and son of a bitch. So after about five mini games, you'll play a remix, which is one big chonko mini game that puts everything you just learned to the test, which in my case is apparently nothing. God, are you fucking serious? Despite only ever releasing in Japan though, as well as coming out when the DS was already a thing, the first Rhythm Heaven apparently did well enough to get an arcade port made by Sega in 2007. Then just a year later in 2008 and 2009 everywhere else in the world, we got Rhythm Heaven Gold on the DS. Yeah, I, I don't really like this one. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of really good mini games here. I just don't like this. You have to like awkwardly hold the DS like a book and control it with the touchscreen, which brings back memories of the I don't know, man. I like this game, but this whole setup just feels like Nintendo trying to justify the DS's touchscreen. I just don't feel like anything of value was really added from the touch controls. Uh, like take uh, Owen Don, for example. Uh, that's something that could only work with a touchscreen. But here, you could easily map all of these games to buttons and nothing would change. Which they actually went and did seven years later. Buttons just work way better for this kind of game in my opinion, and I think even Nintendo agrees, because... Oh, this! This is beautiful. So you hear the phrase, Rhythm Heaven on Wii, and you instantly think, Oh, shit, I'm gonna have to get up, aren't I? But no, there's absolutely no motion controls whatsoever here. You're just tapping buttons in time with the rhythm. Just like God intended. This is without a doubt my favorite Rhythm Heaven. It's just got the best collection of mini games, the best remixes, it looks amazing, and it's got a ton of fun extras like a two player mode which can be a lot of fun. Four years later, we get Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix for the 3DS, which was a collection of some of the best mini games from the series, uh, with a few new ones mixed in. Uh, also, it's got a story mode, because yeah, the, that's exactly what Rhythm Heaven needed. But I'd probably say this is the best one for newcomers to start with. If you can still get it. Alright, Nintendo, what the fuck? Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix is digital only. Which means when the 3DS eShop eventually gets shut down, this game is gone for good. But it did get a physical release in Europe and Japan, but whoa, whoa, whoa there big guy, the 3DS is region locked, so you can't even do that. Well, alright, I hear you say, I'll just get a fever. I, I mean, you did say that was your favorite. So you don't need your liver, right? Now, the Rhythm Heaven Fever is on the Wii U eShop, but again, just like the 3DS, once that eShop gets shut down, that game is also gone for good. And that will only drive up the prices for the physical copies even more. It's just so disappointing that these games are more readily available, because Rhythm Heaven truly is the most unique series of rhythm games out there. Hell, I'd even say it's the only true series of rhythm games. It's not just some glorified game of Simon like most other games in the genre. It's literally you playing games with your natural sense of rhythm. And because a sense of rhythm is something every person has naturally, it allows these games to be enjoyed by basically anyone. Well, as long as you can fucking afford it.